All right, guys, today I'm going to be talking about the composition and extent of the English turn forests. Okay, so first let me show you where English turn is. Do you guys know where English turn is? Okay, let me, let me show you where it is. Now, uh, I am kind of um, like Google Earth a little bit too much, so you're going to have to indulge me here. Let's pretend we're riding a meteor ripping through the atmosphere heading, atmosphere heading for English Turn, okay? So this is the New Orleans area. Oh. Okay, so there, here's the terminus of the Mississippi, right? And here's all these wetlands. Also called, what do you call the terminus? You guys know the name for that? Delta. Yes, Birds from Delta. Good, Birds from Delta. And here are all these wetlands south of, of New Orleans. Um, and this, of course, is New Orleans in all, in all its concrete glory. You can see uh, Ponja Train above it and the Miss, Mississippi snaking through there. And now to the east of the, of the um, city, right over here, is English Turn. So here's English Turn. Has, has Sean told you why they call it English Turn? Well, apparently some Frenchman by the name of Brenville, apparently, saw something, this is like 1699, saw an English fleet, or at least one big Bienville. English, Bienville. Bienville, trying to, going up the Mississippi to form a colony at New Orleans, and of course he wanted the French to have that, that land. So he uh, somehow talked to these English, ca English sailors, captains, and said, um, the, New Orleans has been settled by the French. They built fortifications. They've got all these huge guns pointed at the river. And if you go up river, they're going to blow you out of the water. So the English turned around. I thought it was because there was a big turn in the Mississippi, but no. It's because the English turned their boats around and left. Of course, it turned out that Brenville, how do you say it? Br Bienville. Bienville was uh, not telling the truth. There were no forts. Psych. But, but he also tricked them. So they, they also cut down cypress, big cypress trees, and right, right uh, in that area, they, um, they cut down cypress trees and they stuck them out to try to look like cannons, you know, up hidden in the, in the um, trees. And so um, the way ships worked back in the day was sail, right? So this is a huge turn. So if, you, if the wind is blowing one direction, you're coming up here and you want to, and you want to keep going up up the river with wind, you have to change your sails and tack. So basically you have to come to a stop at English turn. And so, so it was a perfect defensive position because whoever came, the biggest army in the world would come to a screeching halt and would take some amount of time to change over and be sitting ducks is the idea. So it was a very um, daunting position to be a potential enemy coming up and you're like, man, I don't want to go there because they have cannons or just slaughter us, right? They can't turn, they can't move their boats, so that's why it's called English Turn. So the cool thing about English Turn, as you can see, it's that it's got a couple of relatively large fragments of lowland hardwood forest. And um, I, say, I say relatively because hardwood forests in, New, in the New Orleans area are almost all gone. Here's, here's an example of that. This is uh, a paper published in 2002 by White and Skojak. Um, in it, they do the floristic surveys of, of seven of the largest hardwood fragments left in the New Orleans area. Here's a better, here's a better map of it. Um, a, of course, A is, is uh, the forest they called Airline, S is Sauvage. Here's Lafitte, uh, Verret. Oak, Hermit, and Jackson. Now, um, here's where English Turn is, right there. For some reason, they didn't include the, uh, the uh, English Turn Forest in their survey. It's kind of a, I wonder why that is. Anyway, um, here's the sad part of this story. Because between the time they wrote the paper and had the paper review, and published the paper, uh, Airline, two forests, Airline and Verret, had been cut down for development. 
just in that short time. So um, obviously that's not a good thing. These, these four, as Sean may have told you, among other things, provide ecosystem services that help buffer New Orleans from um, the, you know, the negative effects of climate change and, and sea level rising. Because these, these forests essentially are like big sponges. They soak up water and then release them slowly. And in soaking up the water, uh, that's water that would normally be flowing into levees and into populated areas. So by, get ridding, by getting rid of these f forests and wetlands, you, you rob the ecosystem of some of its elasticity. Um, so um, Sean and I are, and John are, are currently working on a paper in which we're, we're planning on visiting these remaining forests and seeing how they fared uh, in the last 13 years. Okay. Uh, the English Turn Forest, the ETF, as I like to call it, is, <laughs> is basically a peninsula uh, created by these uh, two very sharp turns in the Mississippi there. And then it's bounded on the west by that canal, big canal, and uh, at the south by that development. Uh, the development right here. Uh, so here it is basically. I bet you didn't know that, that PowerPoint had a GIS function. Wow. As you can see, the forest has been you know, heavily impacted. Here's a golf course here, which I'd actually like to play. Does anyone play golf here? Yeah, really? Are, yeah I'm, I'm kind of into golf myself. Not really. I mean, I play it like three <laughs> times a year. But this, one, this course was designed by Jack Nicholson. And in any case, it's... It, uh, you know, it uh, destroyed a lot of this hardwood for us. And you can see that there's, there's some military stuff going on down here, and there's a community right here, and there's a lot of suburban encroachment around this edge. Um, so I'd say that approximately 50% of the English Turn Forest has been developed or degraded. Now, the good news is that there is like 50% of the forest is more or less intact in these three big patches um, that I call the Southwest Forest over here, the Triangle Forest, and the Northeast Forest. Now, um, uh, what, well, a good thing about this area is that you know, there, these, these patches are almost continuous. There's, it's probably, there's conti the Northeast Forest and the Triangle Forest are probably continuous through a little strip over here. And the distance between the southwest forest and the triangle forest is only two or three hundred meters. So they're almost continuous. So, and so together, these are a relatively big chunk of forest. And um, so could be good targets for conservation efforts. In fact, uh, two large patches are currently being managed. Uh, as reserves by Katie Braestead, which you're going to meet, who you're going to meet, and this is where you're going to be working, in the Oakland Trail, in Oakland Trail, Woodland Trails, and in Delacroix. Um, and I miss, as I mentioned before, we're we're, work, we're attempting to write a paper about the floristics of these two reserves, and then we're going to compare these floristics to the forest sampled by White and Skojak. So last year we set up some, some plots in Delacroix, and that's what I'm going to show you now. This is, this is Delacroix Preserve, and these are the, six, the eight plots that we, we censused last year. Uh, we sampled trees and the understory, but I'm just going to show you tree data today. Yeah, sure. Well, you know, some people some people call some people called what this a swamp, but when I think of a swamp, I think of you know more or less year-round inundation. Uh, this this forest is is dry a lot of the time, but gets gets inundated when it rains when it rains hard. The answer is yes, yeah, swamp. It's just, I, mean, I mean, in the general term for swamp, it would be a swamp. So marsh, herbaceous plants like what we have out here, a marsh. Wooded wetland we call a swamp as a general term. So the, the more botanical folks would, would characterize this as a bottomland hardwood forest, which is one type of swamp in the broader sense. Although 
Although if we're there, most people call it swamp. S W swamp, kind of swamp. So yeah. So would you look at the tops of tall trees? So just because it can go months and months without being and being bone dry, or it's bone dry during the winter, it's still it's still a swamp. The Army Corps jurisdictional, the legal definition, the federal definition of what is a wetland, 14 days of water on the ground a year. That's all it huh. to qualify as a wetland. I didn't know that. Yeah. So, uh, no, there's no, there's no just mm. water, standing water on the surface for at least 14 days makes it wet. So we sampled, um, we sampled trees greater than 10 centimeters uh, in, um, in uh, DBH. And then we also s surveyed the, the sort of understory, but today I'm just going to be talking to you about the trees, so you tree data. About, are you talking about property? Like, can you get the property at all or no? Can you get it at all? What? Here, can you scoot back? Can you scoot back to. Scoot back. Yeah. So just, just to be, just for clarity here, so this Woodlands Trail, this was, the, this was a starter. This is the starter property. This. It, we're right on the line between uh, Plaquemines Parish, the more southerly parish, and then Orleans, which is the city of New Orleans. So the Woodlands Trail area, this lower light blue blob, is, is in Plaquemines Parish. Um, Katie, we'll get, we'll get the whole story later, but Katie basically started her nonprofit to conserve this chunk. So all of this was forest, where the golf course was forest. And the short version is the, the development, the, the, all of a sudden, uh, this was publicly held land. Everybody thought it was somebody, some private person held it, and then people figured out that it's actually, it was, it was public land. So then a developer made an offer to the, to, the, to the owner, to the government, and purchased it and then immediately plowed it under and turned this into a golf course and, and, and high-end home development. So that's the, that, that scared people, because then the developers started saying, hey, I can, I can develop all this area. So Katie formed what was originally called uh, Woodlands Trail and Park, a 501c3, and she, it was based her, it was just her. And she said, hey, we should say this. And so she convinced the parish to let her, let her organization manage this, this land as a park for the, for the greater community. People could walk there, people could you know, go ride bikes there, people could go recreate, etc. That still is in existence. But then about, again, it's getting old, I can't remember, three years ago, four years ago, I can't remember. Um, uh, we actually outright purchased the Delacro property. So this, so, Woodlands managed, and, and now the, the nonprofit has changed its name. Now it's called Woodlands Conservancy is the, is the name of the entity. Still same entity, but just changed its name. Woodlands Conservancy. Woodlands Conservancy manages Woodlands Trail. Woodlands Conservancy owns outright in fee title Delacro. And so we're trying to acquire the rest of this horseshoe area and sort of complete the, complete the U-shape thing. So just... Just by way, so we have a lot of many, many, many years of data of the Woodlands data. Uh, excuse me, the Woodlands site. The Delacro is a new thing. So we just have a couple years of data. We've just been spinning that up. Um, so, okay, good. Okay, good. Keep going. All right. So, uh, so here are, here are our sites. Um, we did uh, trees and we did understory. I'm just going to show you understory. This is John at Delacro. John Lambrino, so you guys. Super expensive, super expensive jacket. Yes, that's the, what we call trash bag technologies. Um, you guys all met John, he Skyped in from Oregon. Now, what I, I, what I think we need to do is put in another four sort of plots down here, Sean, down at the bottom okay. and sort of in the middle, and then we'll have it sort of geographically covered, and that should be enough because uh, White and Skojack only had like 12 plots per, per, okay. per forest, maybe a little bit more, maybe 16. But that looks good to me. Here's John in this, in this beautiful forest. It is a little wet that day. I don't know if you can see that. Okay, by the way, I figured out a way to make a whole trash bag suit. In other words, we were entirely covered with trash bags. No need for raincoats at all. 
Okay, this is uh, the list of the tree species uh, from Woodlands and Delacroix, for which we have collected herbarium specimens like the ones that are over there. Okay, so we have documented evidence of their existence, and I'll show you those later. This is 30 species in 22 genera and in 17 families. Now, these, this, this list is in alphabetical order according to family, then genus and species. We collected these plants over a period of several, several weeks on different trips, some in the spring, some in the fall, some in, in July. Um, some of these species are really rare. So I think we only saw Gladetsia, one individual of Gladetsia, and one individual of Populus deltoides, and maybe just one of, of um, uh, Prunus caroliniana, um, and some, you know, just a few, just a few individuals. So this is a list of 30 species, tree species, um, but some of these are very rare, and some of them are, are much more, are much more common. And this is the data from the eight plots we did at Delacroix. And so, you know, uh, these are in, in order of abundance, or so, same, so, huh? Oh, the DBH is just uh, diameter at breast height. It's uh, some rough measure foresters use for, me you know, kind of uniformly figuring out a place to measure the diameter of a tree. Is it a big honking thing, or is it a little teeny sapling? Right. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, are you guys, what, uh, what majors are you guys in? Are you guys are in a bunch of different majors? Environmental science. Art. We have art. Uh, oh, cool. We have communication. Biology. All right, cool. All right, so um, so as you can see, there are a lot fewer species. There's only 15 species here. We lumped Fraxinus because they're kind of hard to identify, so we lumped them into one thing. Um, and since we're subsampling this forest, the, the rare species tend to drop out. Now, trying to characterize a forest using abundance or density is kind of misleading because, you know, a lot of small individuals can look more important than uh, just a few large individuals. So foresters have come up with this, this measure that tries to factor in the size of the trees. And they call this, this um, importance value. So... Um, Importance value is species relative density. So that's, that's a measure of how many trees there are per unit of area. And relative means it's just, it's like the percent of the total. And then you add that to a species relative basal area. And basal area, as it says down here, is just the cross-sectional area of the tree at breast height. So it's just pi r squared, essentially. So you add those two things together and you get species importance value. Species importance to the ecological community. So um, this is tree species importance values for Delacroix. On the left, the left column is Delacroix. And the white and Sojak forests are in the middle, starting with Lafayette, going to Sauvage, and then the, the last column is the mean importance value for the, for the white and sojak forests. Okay, that's the mean of, of all those species. Um, and the bold numbers are the top three species in each forest. So Delacroix, which is in that column that says Delacroix <laughs> in yellow, <laughs> Uh, differs from these other forests in some, some significant ways. First thing you might want to check out is the fact that the top two species in the white and scojack forests, Quercus virginiana live oak and um, Celtus levigata, levigata, which is hackberry, is um, that these two, the, the, those are the two biggest species in the um, white and sojak forest, they don't even occur in the plots that we censored at Delacroix. 
So that's a big surprising difference between the these between Delacroix and these other forests. Um, Acer rubrum is the dominant species in our plots at Delacroix, but only oak has similar Acer rubrum dominance, and Acer rubrum is red maple. So only oak has similar Acer rubrum densities. The rest of these have minor Acer rubrum densities, the rest of these forests. So uh, Delacroix is, is, is similar to oak in Acer rubrum density, but the similarity ends there. Our second and third dominant dominance, which are Taxodium disticum and these Fraxinus species, are negligible in oak, as you can see. See, Fraxinus is at point is at 3.5, and a Taxodium doesn't even didn't even occur in oak. So you know, while uh, Delacroix is similar to oak in in red maple, it's very dissimilar in everything else. Uh, and in fact, our second dominant, Taxodium disticum, is a tiny component of the floors of the, the floors of the rest of these forests. And ball cypress, that's what Taxodium disticum is, is a huge, like majestic tree. That's the foundational species for these swamps, these bottomland harvests. This is the cypress that everybody builds their houses out of. Um, and this is when you think of a cypress forest. We have a lot of it. That's good. It's not in other places that bad. And then our third dominant, Fraxinus, is similar only to airline, which has been cut down, which is no more. Cut down for development years ago. I like the RIP though too. So it's so uh, it it really looks like Delacroix is very different floristically from the white and scojack forest. And for that reason alone, I think it's worth some special conservation consideration, uh, biologically speaking. Now, uh, what would be fun would be if we were to finish the Delacroix, uh, finish the Delacroix sampling, do some more sampling at, uh, of these, these 20 meter plots at Woodlands, and then maybe it would be fun to move down to the southwest forest, whatever's going on down there, because it would be really bitchin' If all these forests, they're the last huge bits of this kind of forest left in, in, in New Orleans could be connected. And I think for the purposes of conservation, we should start talking about these three forest fragments as a single system, as the, as the English turn forests. And uh, because they appear to be floristically unique, we may, a, we may be able to apply some sort of bio, biological leverage for conservation of these forests in these areas. All right, so now let's go through some of these species and learn them up. You heard me mention this one before. This is red maple, Acer rubrum. It's in the uh, Sapindaceae. That's the family. Family is the Sapindaceae. Um, and it looks like a maple leaf, essentially, all right? It's got three major lobes with soft serrations and a double, double samara, which you won't be able to see. I think there's some on there. You can kind of see it over here, this double samara. It's one of those seeds that you throw and it's sort of helicopters. Helicopter wings. And it's got, these hu it's got a huge distribution. And partly it's got this huge distribution because it's good in dry. It's got a lot of environmental elasticity. It's, it's good in dry soils well-drained soils, and it's good in wet soils. So it's everywhere. It's a major thing. Now, if you guys are, some of you guys are going to be interested in doing conservation work in other parts of the country once you, you know, once you leave here. And so knowing this species, it means that you know something about the forests and the whole, you know, eastern part of the United States. Okay, this is American elm, Ulmus americana in the Ulmaceae. That's an easy one. Um, oh, there's a specimen of it here that you'll see, and it's got these very, this double serrate margins, which you'll see. See these, they have these pinnate veins that go out like this. Pinnate means. pinnate means that um, it's kind of going out from a central axis. And 
these usually pin these pin the ends of these veins usually end in a tooth on the leaf. But when it's double serrate, there's another tooth in the middle of there, in the middle between these veins. So this is a double serrate vein. It's got a, it's got this thing called an oblique uh, base where it's look see it's un, it's not symmetrical. Um, and a single Samara. This is not going to be hard for you guys to, to figure out once we get, get going there. And this is one that you're going to see all over the place. Box Elder. Acer Nagunda. Now, notice that there was another thing that I showed you that was an Acer. Acer Rubrum, which was Red Maple. This is closely related. It's in the same family, the Sap and Dacie. Now, it's a maple, right? It's a maple. Red maple is in the sap and daisy, so that's sort of easy to understand because we get maple syrup from the sap. So whenever you think of maples, you know, think of the sap and daisy. Um, but these these leaves are not are not one leaf. They're pinnately compound. That means they're made up of these leaflets. So you can see here these three leaflets: one leaflet, two leaflets, three leaflets. Usually they're three, they can actually have more. And they have the typical double Samara of this family. Right? And they also have a huge distribution. Look at this huge distribution. Okay, so know this one, and you're gonna know a lot of the trees in these areas. Here's another tree with a huge distribution. Green ash, Fraxinus Pennsylvania, Pennsylvanica. It's in the Oleaceae, which is the olive family. I don't, it's kind of weird that it would be in the olive family, but <laughs> there it is. Another huge distribution. And this guy's got really, pin, also has pinnately compound leaves. So the leaves are made up of a series of leaflets. This is one leaf composed of a number of leaflets. Um, and there's, we, you know, there's, you're going to see it, when you, when you see it, you'll, you'll recognize it because there aren't that many things that have these lots of compound leaflets, up to seven compound leaflets. That will identify it as an ash. We're not, you're not going to have to identify it to species. You're just going to have to identify it as an ash, okay, as a fraxinus. Oh, here's a cool one. Here's another ash, close relative to Pennsylvania, Pennsylvanica. This is Fraxinus uh, profunda, or pumpkin ash. But look, look at the distribution uh, on this one. It's very spotty distribution, but you can see right here, it's got a little tiny distribution right where the uh, English churn forests are. There's a lot of pumpkin ash. But it looks like, it's also sometimes hard to tell these apart from the other ash trees, especially when the leaves are very high up. So all you have to do is know that it's Fraxinus, that it's an ash, okay? And I'm sure you can do it. I bet my ash on it. <laughs> Sorry, that's terrible. That was very <laughs> That was terrible. Okay, now here we have bald cypress. Now this doesn't yeah, have... Yeah, cypress. Let's hear it for cypress. Yeah, yeah woo! Yeah. And uh, Taxodium disticum. Now, this one has a, a, a weirder distribution that you haven't seen yet, the southern distribution. Um, you'll be able to tell it instantly because it's a gymnosperm. It's the one that's more pine-like. It's the only thing that's pine-like in, in that forest. And the, few, and the fruits are a cone. So this is not going to be a problem for you to understand it. And it's a humongous tree. What, what, does it look like anything to you guys if you just went to the pitch on the left? Yeah, that's right. They're in the same family. In fact, uh, you know what? They may not be in the same family. I think redwoods have been put into the Taxodiaceae. They've got to have a new family for them. Anyway, doesn't matter. But Can, they, look, they look like redwood but the, yeah, leaves. Yeah, they look like re redwood leaves. All those, the, those little, little leaves, those are all one leaf. Those are, no... Each one of those is a leaf. It's not, it's not a pinnate leaf. It's an entire leaf, and it's, the leaf is a little needle-like thing. Okay, here we... Oh, sorry. And now we have some oaks. This is a very common oak at, at, at our location. 
Quercus nigra, water oak, and it has these sort of, we have an example of it here for you to look at. It has these spatula-shaped leaves, but actually the leaves are very variable. And oaks are a real bitch because they hybridize. And they will take, two species will hybridize and the, and the offspring will take on the characteristics of each species. So it can be very hard to, to figure these out by by the leaves. And the, really the only way to tell them apart is the, is the acorns and often you can't find the acorns because these forests have pigs in them. And the pigs gobble up those acorns faster than you can say Jackie Robinson. Damn it, there they go. <laughs> faster than that. <laughs> this is another common oak that you're going to be seeing, Tex, uh, Quercus texana. Um, all the oaks are in the fag ACE. Um, no. Come on, it's the 21st century, guys. <laughs> uh, these, these are bit fairly big trees, not as big as, as cypress and stuff like that. But um, they, these have longer acorns. But it's easy to tell, tell these leaves because they're so deeply lobed. When, we, that's a leaf that's not pinnate. In other words, those aren't leaflets. This is just a single leaf that has these big cutouts, which we call lobes. So we would say that this Nuttles oak is, or, Texas, or Quercus texana, is a very deeply lobed leaf. And here we have this other, another interesting distribution, which is southern and more or less along the Mississippi floodplain. And now, now I'm going to show you some stuff that we're very interested in because that's one of the reasons that you guys are going to be doing these transects is to monitor these endangered, these, these invasive species. So these are very important for you guys to, to figure out. Okay, this is Chinese privet. Lig 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 Ligustrum sinensis. And the funny thing is when I used to grow up, these were all planted as ornamentals all over my grade school. And we used to run around, they make little berries. I don't know, you grab these little berries and you press them between your finger and a seed comes out. And we used to try and, and hit each other in the eye with these seeds. <laughs> it's naturally from China and, and Taiwan and Vietnam, but it's been naturalized in the Pacific Islands, North America, and Central America. Um, All the places we work. There we go. And it's also in the olive family, so weird. Um, I've uh, got some, something for you guys to see over here, uh, a specimen for you to see. It's got these bunches of small flowers on these very dense panicles. A panicle is a type of botanical inflorescence that's, many, that's branched. Um, you're not going to see it in, you're not going to see it in flower, but y you should be able to figure out what it is fairly easily. This guy is really, really bad. Everything boo! boo. Chinese tallow, boo. Triatica semifera. Very bad. It's in the Euphorbiaceae. That's a traditionally sort of, it's like a, it's got its center of diversity in Africa where there are a lot of things that look exactly like cactuses, which are really euphorbs. And it's native to China, Taiwan, and Japan, but it's naturalized here in the, in the southern United States because it was used as an ornamental. This thing is extremely invasive, can become, formed whole forests made up of the species. Um, it's a, it everything out. Yeah, everything the, out. the leaves are, are sort of heart-shaped and they have this little, you know, tip on them or they're rhombic. Ex extremely invasive. Uh, that's, Katie has gone through, has been trying to, to get rid of these from, she goes through a sort of invasive eradication program where she tries to get rid of, cut down these plants. And this is another thing called China Berry. All these, boo. boo! All these things seem to come from China for some reason. Um, Malia Zatarak. Um, and it's got these, again, it's got these pinnate, classic pinnate uh, leaves, okay, with these soft serrated edges. Um, and they're about, the leaves can be long, really long. So this is, this is, an this is one leaf, you see. It's pinnate. This is another leaf that's pinnate. This is another leaf with pinnate. It's got a bunch of leaflets. Um, this look has a very distinctive look. You should be able to get it very easily. Okay. Sorry. All right. So, um, guys, what 
What's your name? Robert. Robert, what's this? Red maple. Red maple, exactly. Do you remember, anyone remember the scientific name? Acerubra. Yes, right, right, right. And what, the, what family is it in? Sap and Daisy, exactly, right. Awesome. Right. Okay, what's, what, which one is this? American Elm, that's right, American Elm, great. Ulmus Americana, it's in the Ulm and AC. There you go. Okay, what's this, guys? Box Elder, exactly. What's the genus? Acer, right, it's a close relative to Acer rubra. Here it is, Acer nagundo, it's called, and it's also in the Sapindaceae. What's this, guys? What? Green That's right. Um, green ash. Fraxinus. In the Oleaceae. Olive family. Pumpkin, Pumpkin ash. All right. Nice. nice work. Great. Here it is. Fraxinus also in the olive. Okay, what's this, guys? Ball cypress. Exactly. Anyone remember the scientific name? Taxodium disticum, right, very good. Now what's this, guys? Obviously you know it's some kind of oak. Water oak, right. Quercus nigra in the Phagaceae. What's this? What? Nuttles oak, nuttle. Nuttle was some sort of super famous biologist in the 1800s. There's so much crap named after Nuttle. Um, it's not crap, it's organisms. Uh, Quercus texana. That's a, kind of weird. Usually the, the scientific name has something to do with the common name, but in this case it has nothing to do with it. In fact, the, the distribution of this plant isn't even in Texas. So, so what up with that? Okay. Boo! Boo! What is this, guys? Chinese privet. That's right. Ligustrum sinensis, also in the uh, olive family. What's this one? Boo! Extremely invasive. Chinese tallow. That's right. Triatica sevifera. In the Euphorbiaceae. That's an important, important family worldwide. So if you guys are interested in being biologists, you got to memorize this one, U4BACE. And here's our last one that I'm going to show you. Boo. Boo. China berry. All these bad things come from China. Not, you know, I'm not, that's, maybe that's insensitive. I didn't really mean that that <laughs> way. But these plants seem to come from China. Yes, China berry, Malia azadarac. Okay, invasive. So that's it, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now, what you guys would probably love to do is come and look at some of these in the flesh. Well, they're not really, yeah, they're, they're like plants, but two-dimensional and more brown. <laughs> so come on over and have a look at them. Especially these invasives right here. And there's a couple here that I didn't show you in, the qu in that visual quiz. That these invasives, this is... That's China. It's China Berry. That's China Berry. You guys recognize that one? That's the no, that's the one before the tap. That's the privet. That's the stuff I used to squeeze in my brother's eye. <laughs> that that's, that's something else. That's, this is um, Sambuca Americana. This is elderberry. You're going to see this on the site, elderberry. In fact, some of the elderberries may be forming fruits and stuff like that. This is Chinese tallow. Chinese tallow. But the celtus is another thing I didn't show you up there. That's the hackberry. Hackberry. But, China berry. Yeah, tallow, privet, China berry.